Welcome to another edition of Nucleus Investment Insights. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about international shares uh, by, by Australia, uh, sorry, by international, sell the rest of the world. Uh, no. we have, sell Australia. Sell Australia, yes. <laughs> sell Australia, yes. So we have uh, David Llewellyn Smith, Chief Strategist here as well. Hi, David. G'day, Damo, listeners. Thanks for coming on once again. So uh, just a reminder, everything you're going to hear today is general advice in nature. It doesn't uh, constitute personal and financial advice. Uh, if you do want personal financial advice, you can book in with a call for us and we can talk you through uh, or, or send it or, or, um, uh, or yeah, talk to one of our financial planners. Uh, what we're going to focus on today, uh, we're going to sort of approach this from two different angles. One is sort of some macro side of it uh, about reasons that um, international looks uh, more attractive than, than Australia. And the second one is um, uh, some of the some of the individual stock exposures you can get. So some of the big themes which we've uh, really been pushing for, where uh, those themes are much more prevalent um, overseas than what they are in Australia. So Australia, um, you know, you largely get the resources and banks, and um, uh, we're sort of looking for more, you know, cloud, AI, obesity, robotics. You know, a lot of the sort of newer um, sort of productivity uh, enhancing. Uh, sectors which are uh, which we think are, should be the, the theme for the moment, but uh, Dave, maybe we should jump straight to you for um, some of the uh, the macro reasons why why should you be clearing out of Australia for macro purposes? Sure. Well, we're, I'm going to love this, of course. Um, uh, so, so viewers have probably seen over the last six months or so making reference to uh, the likelihood of another lost decade in Australia um, based around some similar themes of what triggered our last last decade uh, over in the in the sort of period or the decade leading up to COVID um, uh, and so some of these themes will be recognizable from that period and the probably the one that we'd lead off with and the main one that really triggered a lot of Australia's problems through that that profitless growth era uh, was the big, big the big stall in China uh, post the GFC stimulus where Xi Jinping decided enough was enough uh, and and suddenly choked back especially on property in China around 2011 or 2012 when he got in he then ebbed and flowed on it for a few years, but had a real crack at it in like 2014, 15. And, you know, we had a big terms of trade crash. This is when the iron ore managed to get to $37 for a brief period. Uh, now, that is called a terms of trade crash. And we think that we're going to rerun this over the next few years. The terms of trade is, is, is a ratio of your exports um, by imports. And it, it's really kind of a measure of... of your pay, I guess, or your purchasing power uh, in the global economy. And so when the terms of trade go up, you're effectively getting a pay rise as a nation. Uh, and when they go down, you're getting a pay cut as a nation. And so national income falls. And when it's these major bulk commodities that drive so much of Australian income, national income, uh, it falls very steeply. Um, so once you get that, there's there's mechanically a flow of negatives that come with it so nominal growth really slows a lot you may not then end up in a proper recession but your nominal growth stalls out you know in a really major way and that ends up sucking down wages you know like like a giant vortex uh, becomes very deflationary <clears throat> excuse me and of course it seriously damages your domestic demand um, as a result <clears throat> the other thing it hits really hard is the federal budget which you know does have a very large slab of mining income in it from the tax take uh, and especially once again from the major commodities the bulks of coke and coal and iron ore so <clears throat> excuse me so when when that hole appears in the budget it has to be filled with either cuts big cuts to fiscal spending which again is bad for domestic demand or rising taxes and it's usually a combination of both 
And of course, that's bad for domestic demand as well in terms of <clears throat> holding back households who will already be struggling because of wages being sucked down. So it basically deflates your whole economy. Um, and it's quite, quite difficult. You, you know, you can get through it through various policy measures, none of which we use properly. Um, but typically what we do instead is boost immigration. Well, that is what we did do in the last, uh, as a policy response to the last time this happening, um, as a way to try and boost demand. But of course, you know, that's a labor led boost to demand, not an investment led boost. And that has all sorts of uh, implications as well that are largely negative again for wages. Uh, it suppresses productivity too, because you're, you're shallowing your capital. And so you get no income growth and you get no profits. Again, it's profitless. It's growth, but it's profitless growth. Yeah. So just just to expand on that, so so it's what David's talking about there in terms of the capital is is Australia has a certain amount of capital and a certain amount of people, and ideally in a in in an economy that's going forward, you get more and more capital. You get more and more things that are in the economy doing it, whether it's factories and automation and and, all, and ports and all these things that are that are, that are trying to that make everyone more productive because yes, a machine yep. does that now. No longer, we no longer need a people to do that. And so, so what we've done instead is we've poured lots of people in. And so our capital is actually um, capital per person has been falling, which is part yes. of the productivity issue. Exactly so, right. And so you, it's disproductive, right? You get less product, you, you get less productive. It's funnily enough, it's quite labor intensive because you, you and everyone ends up, you know, kind of riding a bike, delivering food. Um, uh, and so, you know, you just end up in this kind of weird spot where you're creating lots of labor, inten labor intensive um, sort of bullshit jobs, I guess you would call it. But it's not good for, for, for kind of economy wide profits or nor the stock market. What it is good for is bonds um, because it's very deflationary. So um, there's another problem, however, in this cycle as we think that this, this transpires. China is like the first domino, if you like. Smashing into this, we've got AI. And now on one front, if AI kind of delivers on its promise over the next five years, 10 years, uh, then you will get some big productivity gains, which would help, you know, Australia get through, uh, you know, these big income losses. However, uh, uh, you know, there's a sort of distinction in, in these technological advances between labor enabling technology, which doesn't really cost you jobs, just makes people more efficient, uh, and labor replacing technology. And AI is the latter, or tends towards the latter. And so you're going to lose quite a lot of services job, jobs in Australia over this next business cycle. Um, and this is going to crash into this labor-led growth model, just as it's pressured by uh, this big China stall in terms of trade falls. Uh, and so pouring labor into that, so that scenario uh, is going to be, well, I don't even know if it's sustainable, to be honest, like it may actually cause a, a political rupture around immigration. Um, if immigration, if if AI were to, to structurally lift unemployment, for instance, then pouring pouring immigration into those circumstances is pretty difficult. Um, yeah. That being that being said, you know we got up to sort of I think about seven percent unemployment um, after the mining boom went bust, and they still managed to pour the immigration in. So, so I mean they'll almost certainly try. Um, so again, that's deflationary. And it's interesting as well on that on those labor losses front. To date, it's been mainly the white collar workers um, yes. who've been losing their their, their or, well, yeah, either losing jobs or just not, or just weak weak hiring in that those white collar workers, especially the junior end of the white collar workers. Um, yeah, it, it, I, I guess my take is I think the the real disruption from a um, uh, from a society perspective, is going to when, when it starts to crash into some of the year, your blue collar workers, and that's that sort of probably the the driving is the key one to really watch there because um, I think is it uh, if it's not the most um, the, the biggest job 
description of, of being a driver. It's it's close to it's one of the top job descriptions. Whether it's mixture of delivery drivers, you know, um, uh, Ubers, taxis, bus drivers, you know, all, you go through all the different the groups, truck drivers, um, and add them all up. It's a it's a huge proportion of the economy that is that is involved with that, and that's um, uh, yeah, it's one one thing to say. Okay, here's somebody a white collar person who's lost their job. Um, they've potentially got other things they can do, or they can step down the the uh, you know, if, if you're in sort of a, a middle income, you can step down into to lower middle income. But when you're already on at at or close to the minimum wage and you lose your job, it's obviously a lot harder than to, to find something else. Yes. No, uh, I mean, I do think white collar workers are capable of being angry as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there are, um, oh, we've been very happy to admit there are many unknowns in the AI rollout. Um, probably the largest being speed. Like how fast does it come? Um, how fast does it substitute for various roles? And, um, and if it's, you know, if it takes more time to train up these these models, uh, and and eliminate their hallucinations and and you know get them functioning in various data sets than 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 we think, then it, you know it could be absorbable. Yeah, um, well, but, and, and so but it probably looks more dangerous than that to labor I would yeah because and, and i guess from my perspective you know my um my experience to date is that it's it does the 80 percent um accuracy or 85 percent accuracy pretty well like it's uh as long as you've got somebody watching it you know and and you can go yeah okay that's going to do 80 85 percent of my work for me well that's you know that's five in six people losing their job you know <clears throat> Or yeah. four and five people losing their job at, at that level so mm -hmm. um and then the next bit you know getting from 80 to 81 to 82 to 83 that's going to take a long time and and you know and 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 then exactly that's the problem driverless cars has got to is yeah they got to the 99 percent really quickly but actually getting up you know 99 percent might sound good but if if the car's on the road for you know pretty much non-stop then then that's one accident every four days and so yeah 99 percent isn't good enough it needs to be you know 99.99999 whatever and that's the problem they've been having so so the the pure yeah there's no human involved at all we need it to be run all the time um is difficult and, and i think you'll find that in in all the jobs but the part about can i get it to do 80 percent yeah i think that's going to come that's going to come really quickly yeah so Again, that's deflationary, right? So, and productivity uh, enhancing, uh, and well, yes, which which would be good, except uh, you you you're pouring this into into this labour led growth model that's so disinflationary that, I mean, uh, you don't know where the, those those inputs and outputs are going to shake out precisely, but what you do know is Australia's not going to benefit like other countries will. Because they don't have that disproductive growth model, um, and so that's a headwind. It's at minimum a relative headwind to profits, yeah. and possibly worse. Um, so all of that means monetary policy is going to be loose. We think um, once the RBA figures all of this out, of course, they're still making very strange noises as if they weren't there for the last ten years, as they kept things too tight. Uh, and ignored, you know, low inflation and crushed wages, uh, and hopefully they'll, they'll kind of wake up a little more swiftly this time. But yeah, very still... vigilant for a wage breakout, aren't they? <laughs> very <laughs> vigilant for a wage breakout. That is for the no wages in, in the entire developed world. Um, yeah, because we, did, we, we, we don't possibly have productivity. Have... Right? Yeah, that's right. But we did possibly have one of the worst wage breakouts. What, 15 years ago? 17, no, longer. 17, 18 years ago. You mean one, like 40, 45 years ago? Right? Well, no, I was doing it during the mining boom. During the mining uh, boom. Well, yeah, we did yeah. for like three months. Exactly, I mean, exactly. But but we're scared straight now and we're never, no, never yeah. going to allow that to come we're again. Going to, uh, yeah. In the next right, five but, decades, yeah, crushing yeah. wages. Uh, so that, that means we think the Australian dollar is endemically weak as well. Now, that doesn't mean it's always weak. And in fact, I think we're going through a, you know, a strongish Australian dollar period right in front of us, which is one of the purposes for this potty, in fact, because we think uh, any period of rising Australian dollar is a great opportunity to get your money offshore because over the cycle, 
<clears throat> what we see is is a reflection of what happened to Australia in the 1990s, where you have, you know, a technology boom driving the US and to some extent Europe, less so, but to some extent, but certainly developed markets. But um, Australia missing out largely because uh, you're in the middle of a commodities bust. And in that on that occasion, it was, you know, the post-Japan bust, uh, which ran for a full 10 years through the 1990s. Um, and and so you're going to get these enormous yield differentials between Australian interest and international, uh, and and there's no there's no AI winners here. I mean, yes, the services business, but no no intrinsic AI winners. There's, we don't have any. There's a bunch of individual. There's a bunch of individual companies who will absolutely benefit, but, but yes. the broad mass of the Australian economy is not set up for. We're, we're one of the least sophisticated countries in the world in terms of. Yeah, and so. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're, 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 we're way down on the economic sophistication list, aren't we? I can't remember how low, but it's embarrassing. Somewhere below... It's well, somewhere, in the hundreds. It's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's like in it's, line with the average African country. Yeah, yeah it's somewhere in Africa. So, uh, so 1990s rerun, you know, gives you a currency that just doesn't stop falling. Uh, and so, you know, I'm using... The, you know, the 40, what have we got to 47 or something at the end of the 1990s? And, and I can see that re repeating. And so any any opportunity you get to get your assets offshore whilst the Australian dollar is stronger than that is good. And then you obviously, if if you write about your allocations, you're going to get the better returns in these, these international markets that are driven by you know, the, the more profitable dimensions of the business cycle plus big currency uplift. So that's the basic principle behind this podcast. Uh, and the only other sort of immediate winner coming out of it for Australia uh, is is sort of non-mining. Australia's uh, infinitesimal non-mining external sector that's exporters that, that uh, you know, aren't in mining. Uh, which would benefit from this falling currency, um, but you know they're small, and and the, some of the big winners in that sec segment, you know, you sort of med tech and places like that are actually in trouble for other reasons, like um, CSL resumed, etc. My, my all have headwinds around around obesity drugs and peak fat and, and other things. So so Australia is going to be a tough place to invest, basically. Um, over the next business cycle as we see it. But the good news is uh, the principal adjustment mechanism for that will be the currency. And so if, you, if you're offshore during that, then it's, uh, it's a huge boon. Excellent. Okay, so let's go to a quick sales message and then we'll come back on the, uh, some of the, the sectors. We'll be back with the investment insights very shortly. Nucleus Wealth is an active and passive investment manager. If you like what you're hearing and want some help with the investing, we can do it for you via our active portfolios. Our tactical and core portfolios use the insights shared in this podcast to construct and manage your investment. We blend tactical portfolios to offer our combinations of international shares, Australian shares, government bonds, and cash. We vary the asset allocation with the goal of protecting your capital in times of market uncertainty. We also have active international... Right. So, uh, in terms of the sectors that are um, that are most at uh, most going to benefit, and, and sort of moving on to that theme, there's a lot of the ones that were sort of very much uh, based on. Uh, well, if you want exposure, you, you you need to go offshore. So we'll start with the obesity ones. Uh, so the obesity ones, the the main thing to, to to note here is look, obesity rates have risen dramatically over the last sort of 20 odd 20 or 30 years you know in in uh the us has sort of gone from from sort of 10 percent ish to to 40 percent ish in terms of the uh the amount of obesity within that uh when you look through the most of the um uh most of the the diseases that are killing people the, the the fastest they believe there's a there's a pretty good uh correlation with with being overweight um you go through you know Talk, talking to doctors over any one of sort of a range of different um, uh, diseases, 
you know, if you if you can take the person who's got the disease and drop them 10 kilos, all of a sudden that gets rid of a whole bunch of their problems. And so this is the issue is that, you know, most of your, most of your medical spend goes to a very small number of uh, people, uh, the, the, the sickest people. And so if you can take the sickest part of, of society and make them um, significantly healthier, probably you know, not into the healthy range yet, but certainly just less, less extreme, then you can really lift some of that weight on the, on the medical system. And so, uh, yeah, it does have a big benefit for the uh, obesity, the, the, the companies that have the obesity drugs. Um, uh, and, and, yeah. and again, it's not to say that we won't see some side effects or something come up and, and, and the drugs, um, you know, it's not without risks, I guess, but at the moment, it very much looks as if, um, the side effects are, are, are minimal enough that, um, relative to the benefits, uh, that, that they're, you know, they're, they're being, uh, prescribed more than what, um, we're actually producing. And so those companies we think have still got some upside and there's still some, some benefit in, in terms of those and, and, the, and they'll get better as well. Like the initial uh, formulations were uh, for um, uh, it was all about diabetes. Now that they've actually sort of honed in on, on some of the key measures for this and the, and the key issues around, around weight loss is that whether we'll start to see some, some improvements in terms, of those, uh, in terms of those drugs. There's also a fair bit more in terms of technologically on the, on the drug front as well uh, around sort of uh, customizing drugs to people, sort of uh, better analysis now of, of, um, uh, of, of genetic, uh, people's genetics and, and things like that that, can, that will allow um, more targeted drugs. And so uh, there's, there's that two sides to that. One is, yes, there's, there's the companies who are benefiting from it, but there's also a lot of the other companies within that who are gonna be losing out, a lot of the other um, uh, bigger medical companies where there's, there's issues in terms of uh, losing revenues and, um, and, and losing a lot of their, their, sort of their, their best customers. Um, playing into this sort of same theme is, is life expectancy. So I've got a few charts up to sort of showing uh, that post COVID, we're actually still having significant excess deaths in a range of different countries around the world. And uh, what's effectively happened very much in the, um, sort of in the second half of, of 2023, you know, insurance companies went from saying uh, that, okay, we've had, a, we've had an excess amount of deaths uh, from, from COVID. And their, their impression initially was um, a lot of the people who died were, were quite sick already and would have died within the next few years. So if you're looking at say a, a cohort of, of 50,000 people who, who are sick and you're expecting to die sometime in the next five years, but actually most of them ended up dying, you know, in the COVID years because they got COVID and, and died earlier, is that you would then expect uh, a payback at some point where you, you're, you've got above trend. And so now there's actually fewer people to die next year because a lot of the sick people uh, have already died in the prior year. Now that was the expectation. Uh, what actually ended up happening was we actually saw um, those excess deaths continue into, uh, into into as far as 2023 and and, and even uh, into 2024 for some countries. And so what what's effectively happened now is insurance companies have said actually we were wrong. This stuff's going to last much longer. And so what they've done is changed their pricing models to to assume that uh, these excess deaths are going to continue for for um, uh, yeah out to 2030 or, or, or beyond for some. For some of them uh, now so so there's there's two sides to this one is um, you know can these obesity drugs actually help improve life expectancy and we think the answer is a big yes so we do think there'll be a, some you'll get some positive surprises on the, on the life expectancy side and secondly um, I guess our analysis tends to it tends to and, and, and I guess the analysis of a, a number of different um, uh, groups to sort of sit on the same part when you dig into the cohorts, there's a lot of deaths in the sort of 60 to 80 range that that seemed that's where most of the excess deaths seem to be uh, at lower ages and um, uh, the the excess deaths do seem to have disappeared and so it's a question about for us is whether the, the argument still stands that people who are getting COVID are dying earlier but um, it's just extended out over over a bigger group of people and um, and that effect will at some stage um, uh, you know have a have a payback even just as as people build up more natural immunity and the people who are the most susceptible and so we do think there's a payback to the other side of that and so if you get the at the double whammy of both um obesity drugs helping to improve life expectancy plus um uh 
uh, the, the, the eventual normalization of, uh, of of the death rates from COVID is that that's, uh, they're both quite positive for the, um, well, both the medical sector, but also uh, insurers as well. Um, uh, so yeah, medical insurers is, is where we, and uh, life insurers is where we, we think um, there's some, there's some still some value based on those. And there's a macro angle here as well, which is, uh, you know, you, you, you medical costs are, are a big drag on productivity, um, days off and, uh, you know, just, just generalized bad health, not, not working as efficiently health costs for the government. Um, all of these things play a, a marginal role and add up to quite a large cost in the economy. So. Uh, I think Goldman did some analysis on the US economy where if they managed to get sort of 70 million odd people on these drugs over say a five year period or over a period of time, it would it would actually uh, add, you know, two to three percent of productive capacity to the economy. Like it was a phenomenal number. Yeah. yeah. Now you can take that with a grain of salt, but I do I do agree that it would be a measurable impact. Uh, and Australia will benefit from that. Like we are obviously, you know, up there on the uh, obesity, global ob <laughs> obesity scale. Uh, and so that will be good. Obviously that, that, that uh, it also lifts labor product um, 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 participation a lot as well, which is big, pro big productivity driver. So, you know, there will, I'm not saying that there will be no benefits for the, if the in these things for Australia, but the benefits uh, won't outweigh the headwinds and, you know, a place like the US, uh, you know, stands to benefit a lot more. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, and, 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 uh, and I think as well, it's, it's an important point you're making is that it's, two, it's that two-sided, isn't it? It's gone from saying, um, I've got somebody who's laid up in hospital and, and, and is sucking in resources to actually that person managed to stay in their job. And so, yeah, yeah. and so it's a, it's not just a, not just win, the cost win. on one side, it's a, yeah, the double up of that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, I will uh, note as well, if you're um, just, just quickly, uh, again, uh, as I've been saying, sort of the labor led model in Australia, you know, being troubling in this cycle, which is all about labor efficiency, the, the obesity drugs are part of this as well. If it's going to lift your labor participation, then you're going to have more labor into a labor led model. And so again, you know, with this, mm -hmm deflationary excess labor story for Australia, which is so profitless. Yes. Um, the next major theme uh, we've got is is sort of, well, I'm, I'm going to combine all three of them. We've, we've done them separately in, in other ones, but it's it's electrification, onshoring and robotics sort of all sort of bundled together. They've all got their, um, uh, they all have different reasons for, for being involved in this. Um, but the, uh, the, the 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 companies tend to actually be the same companies is why I sort of bundle them together in a way. So there's the three themes is one is uh, yeah, increased onshoring. So uh, China had its sort of first uh, foreign uh, first negative foreign direct investment deficit for God knows how many years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, I don't know. Um, forever. Forever, maybe. Um, and, and that's just really a sign that uh, companies are no longer putting more factories into China, you know, that, that the, the, the whole, yeah, people are going to pull their supply chains out of China and into other countries is true, but it takes a long, long time. These supply chains are not quick. And this is just going to be a, a grinding long event for, for China and positive for, um, for the companies that, that are helping with that onshoring and particularly some of the robotics companies where we see, um, you know, the U S has got a lot of policies now trying to bring back, labor and bring back manufacturing into the US and and trying to support that and generally speaking those factories are going to be a lot more automated than what you're going to see overseas and so or, or sorry in 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 countries like China um and so yeah so it's a really trying to get it, get get hold of that we think that's a multi-year possibly multi-decade um theme that's going to that's going to come up uh you know uh europe's in 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 the throes of working out its subsidies and how it can get sort of in on this game as well you know it's been a, a while complaining about the us but but you know it's those those obviously aren't changing and and even i think if you've got a change in president you're not looking at changes in those um and so yeah so i think that manufacturing uh you know onshoring is is very much built in uh and then the other one is 
uh, looking at the, uh, you know, the, the, the cost of power and electrification. So, you know, I won't get too much into the, the climate change wars, but suffice to say, look, um, there is lots changing, you know, regardless of whether you're uh, Peter Dutton and you're all in on a, on a nuclear future or you are, um, uh, you know, just moving to, or you're moving to renewable energies or, or whatever it is, there's change happening within that sector. Um, we're not as convinced about the actual producers of energy, um, but we do think that the the cost in terms of the solar plus batteries is is your sort of upper bound now in terms of saying it's very hard for prices to get above solar plus batteries because above that, um, you know, we've got this almost infinite capability to keep adding more solar and, and, and more batteries. So that cost is, is still um, in most countries above, you know, the cost of um, uh, coal or... or, or or gas at more reasonable prices, but the prices we've seen in recent years, you know, it certainly um, uh, comes through. And and solar itself on its own without batteries is is, if not the cheapest, um, in it's cheapest in, in sunny countries and and at pretty close in in um, uh, even in some of the countries that don't get as much sun. So so where does that mean? What are we, what are we talking about there? Is basically we're sitting this upper bound that energy prices are going to see hard to, to rise much beyond that. Um, we're going to see increased electrification. And so we want companies that are actually involved, um, effectively selling the picks and shovels to, to, to these, is you want people who are actually doing plugging in batteries, turning on nuclear power plants, um, you know, even new gas fired plants, whatever it is, the setting up transformers, batteries, solar. You want the, the, the people that are actually doing that work and getting paid the services companies within that. And, and for, a, for a large part, a lot of those companies actually tend to be companies involved in the robotics and, and, um, uh, and, and that onshoring theme as well. So it sort of sits with it within, that, um, within that theme. Uh, the next theme we have is uh, cloud and AI. Um, oh, sorry. And actually, sorry, just going back to that theme. Again, it's a hard one within that um, robotics and offshoring. You don't get as much as many Australian companies in that in that sort of service sector and and sort of companies that are that are advanced robotics is is not a, not a thing, um, you know generally within within the Australian market and so yeah so much easier to, to find that theme overseas than what it is within Australia. Uh, the next one then uh, cloud and AI so look um, crazy amounts of money being spent on this and uh, the you know the benefits of cloud computing still is is quite dramatic for for most um uh for most companies they're still companies still pushing stuff away from you know uh stuff that was done from systems that were done in house and, and and now they're moving just more and more into the cloud and covid yeah. has really accelerated that um and so you know the a lot of this is just a uh a utilization argument in that a company might have a, a, a computer sitting in its in its um, in its local environment, and it's getting used fifty percent of the time. And then you move it now rents space on a, on a cloud computing thing. Well, it only needs to use fifty percent of that only fifty percent, and and then the other fifty percent of the time, the the cloud computing provider can sell that that processing power and everything like that to to, to another company. So you sort of you know you halve your your, your costs so to speak just just on that alone. And then you get all these productivity gains from, yeah, okay, we've got specialists now, rather than some people, especially in sort of small or medium-sized companies, I've got to hire all these IT guys to run my, my IT suite. All of a sudden, you know, I've got people running thousands of servers and, and tens of thousands of servers. And so the, the productivity gains those people can get and, and, and the tools they can use. And so that, that whole AI theme, uh, sorry, that whole cloud theme, we think is, you know, already had a, 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 a decent tailwind behind it. And then you add in um, artificial intelligence and the, the extra computing power is going to be needed. Uh, and and the whole, you know, every, the, I, I guess there's a part of it, the, um, uh, just the companies who want to get involved in that. And, and I was just, we were spitballing this the other day is that, you know, the, there's going to be, um, uh, AI is, is certainly beneficial from a uh, you know to put it to your company and make your company more productive. Some of this, some of the effect though, is actually literally just going to be on companies refocusing on what they're doing. So, and what I mean by that is, um, we saw it very much during COVID. Uh, is that when companies are just doing they 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 their usual stay in business, doing this is what we did yesterday and the day before and the day before that, and we just keep on uh, doing that. Every now and again, when you do get a, an external shock. Like COVID, where yeah, can people work from home? Can we save um, now on on um, 
cloud costs or, or staff costs from uh, remote working and all, and all these things like that, that extra shock, you know, drives companies to find different ways to do things and often ends up in, in productivity gains. I actually, um, it's a thought of ours, uh, one of these themes from AI, you know, regardless of whether AI itself does it, the fact that AI is out there and companies have to re-examine their business model and worry about competitors coming in from AI and actually work out, well, what am I going to do to be more productive? Given given I, I'm facing a threat of AI, I'm going to have to do something and spend more money on CapEx and, and become more productive to stave off that threat, whether or not you're using the AI yourself. And so that that alone, I think, is is, a, is another sort of good theme for, um, for that cloud and AI. And then the the uh, the other part for those companies obviously is that um, uh, again you just very hard to find that type of exposure within Australia and especially to find the 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 the, the real big solid exposures you're sort of getting more niche players if you if you're trying to find uh, that in Australia so so much easier to find big companies that are that are more likely to um, to be around and and succeed um, uh, or, or and certainly have a lower risk profile um, when you're investing overseas in those ones. Uh, yeah. Anything else on cloud now, Dave? We move to well, again, again, you'd say there are <clears throat> just as there were in the nineties. You know, Australia should benefit uh, like other developed markets from this um, mm. in productivity terms and therefore national income terms. <clears throat> uh, now, as we've discussed, that's going to be weighed against by commodity prices, but. Um, Again, if you're running the, this this labour-led uh, business model, then um, firstly, all of the, those productivity and income gains are going to accrue to capital because you have a permanent labour supply shock. Mm. Uh, so you're not going to get any broad gains from this. So, you know, it'll be um, quite a narrow gain in profitability for for the companies that benefit, that would be, you know, the services firms plus uh, plus the AI firms themselves, which are all offshore, of course. So, uh, again, there will be benefits there, but they won't be widely shared. And, and so that raises a political risk mm. of, uh, you know, possible over-regulation of AI um, or more regulation than elsewhere i guess his only history could tell us whether that was a, a good idea or a bad idea if you if government were to step in and prevent <coughs> ai rollout mm -hmm. uh well actually uh, that's that's an interesting feeds in with one of the questions from uh from robert online just one of the sort of uh, or, or thoughts, I guess, from him worth putting to you, Dave, is that uh, you know, he's just talking about saying that uh, you know there's no way the union's going to allow AI to take their their jobs, and, and I'd probably even point already to things like trains and and trams, where it's quite some of the new stuff can come in driverless, but it's actually very hard for for those ones um, to to replace existing ones, where you know because you'd, you'd think, for example, you know if, if we're almost there on managing cars to to drive around cities. Then managing trams or trains, which are effectively, you know, effectively only going in two dimensions, you yes. stop or you go, would obviously be a lot easier. Um, but you know, the unions are, are obviously going to fight to hold on to their jobs as long as they can. You know, what yes. do you, how do you see Australia relative to other countries in terms of union power and 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 that whole um, that end of it? Uh, well, we have stronger unions certainly than the United States, probably the UK, uh, probably roughly the equivalent of Europe. I guess you would say in terms of uh, political wherewithal. Um, and so, you know, I would expect the unions to have an impact on the AI rollout. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I don't think they could hold back the tide with a broom because the thing is, I mean, it works in the example of a tram, but it doesn't work in the example of an office job because AI is in the cloud. Uh, and you know your the office is going to go from a a physical state box in a building to to a a, a module bolted onto an AI spine in in Palo Alto, yeah. <laughs> and there's nothing the union can do about that. So uh, <clears throat> you know, like the unions may turn turn out to be more. Um, more resistant in the stuff you're talking about earlier with the automation of cars perhaps or or transport um 
but even there, I mean, you know, the taxis were pretty powerful until Uber just sort of ran them over. Uh, and once the consumers get a sniff of, you know, kind lower of prices. Yeah. lower prices, you've lost the battle. Yeah. So uh, I, I would think the unions will have a bit of an impact, but uh, I think they're in real trouble with AI, that's, especially. Yeah, that's one more argument for, you know, given your your view on you know, Australian unions being sort of on par with the Europe, is is if you're picking countries that are going to manage the the AI more smoothly, you, you want the countries that are that are going to that aren't going to hold back productivity for for union reasons, don't you? So, so you're sort of saying that that's one more reason why the productivity think, growth in Australia might be slightly slower than the US or the UK, where where the unions might not um, send send up the gears as much. Yes, um, but I think managing AI is really going to be all about the managing the fallout properly. Yes, like it's 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 a fiscal issue, really. I think fiscal transfers is what this is going to be all about. Mm. You got to retrain well and and political upheaval. Like yeah, people, well, people yeah, do like, want to like, people do like, want to like, work. Don't get me wrong. If this if this rolls out quickly, we'll we'll have luddites, right? Yeah. Um, and quite rightly, people should be pissed off, like. Your job's just going to march off to Palo, the Palo Alto, you Absolutely. know, server. You, you know, I'd be pissed off too. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm watching AI devour the media supply chain, and you know, coming, coming more and more like like a crocodile, kind of making its way up, up, up the shore towards me, and I'm wondering when I'm going to get gobbled, gobbled up. Um, but um, if it is irresistible in a globalized world, and it will be, so. You really need to be looking at, at fiscal transfers to make sure that it's as smooth as possible. And now, you know, that's everything you can think of from tax cuts to 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 a universal basic income and, and everything in between, including, you know, a lot of investment into retraining and and things like that. And see, this is where the labor-led model with immigration really gets shocked, you know, like how do you pour in hundreds of thousands of cheap foreign laborers into this environment? Yeah. Um, like it's, that's just the open question for Australia. And it, it throws in a political risk that nobody else has. Uh, and most certainly is, is potentially very deflationary if, if they persist with it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Except in a few key parts, houses and stuff like that where well, we're creating more and in, more inflation and we spoke about that last week we're creating more inflation than, than what we need yeah well that's right uh, and and then then you're into you know questions of equity as well like and fairness because you know if you if you're going to smash entry level entry level jobs with with computers and the end result is much lower interest rates and you're going to offset that with more immigration to compete with more unemployed people and the offset is then for high house prices what well, you you are putting your your younger generation absolutely to the sword mm. yeah um, well and arguably they've already been put to the sword it's just, uh, oh they have no but i mean well it's dancing Stop. on their grave exactly. yeah that's right <laughs> you know, like you know, it's yeah. it's horrific it, it's a horrific outcome for you for for youth so uh, again I'd, I'd go back to you need a good government knows what they're doing to to lean against these things the effects of these things rather than i being rather than trying to prevent them which i think they'll fail yes at. Yeah. So. yeah but um but but yeah the, but the first they're going to try i guess is the uh is, is our assessment at the moment well they may but but, but unfortunately I think we can be certain that nothing will be done until it's a god awful mess. Yeah. Like they'll be reactive. Yeah. Um, as government, I mean, perhaps not unions, but, hmm. but as government, uh, they will be reactive. They won't be looking to fix anything until we're in crisis. So. No. Excellent. One more, uh, one more theme, and then we'll get to some of the stuff to to try and avoid. Um, uh, the other thing we've sort of this is a mixture of. Um, themes that is 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 more about the the shorter term cycle um but but it's also sort of got some longer term term implications is this idea about quality stocks 
And what do I mean by quality stocks? Is that you know you can break the market, or one one way that a lot of people try to break the market is the three different sections of the market. Um, you've got uh, growth stocks that are that are growing quickly and and are, and are usually priced um, that way, and so are quite a, you know more expensive because they're because they're growing. Um, you've got quality stocks, which tend to be a little bit more expensive, but but, but they're making high margins. Um, they've got um, you know big moats. They've they've got steady earnings. Those types of things. And then finally, you've got your, your value stocks, which are, are cheap, but but usually cheap for a reason. So more like your commodity players, they're less likely to, to have much pricing power. And so um, and each of those different sectors performs well at different points of the cycle. And and our assessment is that um, now is the time for quality stocks. And so quality stocks, um, uh, be, because companies right around the world have pushed through these price rises because of inflation. And now it's about which companies can hold on to them and which are the companies that have to give it back. And so we've already seen a bunch of different sectors, whether it's transport or uh, you know, basic commodities and things like that, that saw these massive price rises, but have had to give it back because they're competitive sectors and they just can't hold on to those price rises. If I'm a tire manufacturer and I'm selling my tires at 50% above everyone else, well, then everyone's just going to go to my competitors. So there's not, there's not enough distinction within that. And so we want the um, the companies that are more like your Microsofts and 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 um, higher quality companies like your um, uh, you know your Apples and and Googles and things like that that have got some some competitive advantage and we think are going to have a much better job do a much better job at, at holding on to price rises. And so um, you know we've seen this long upward. I've got a chart just sort of showing the the um, the US. Uh, operating profit margin over the last sort of 30 or 40 years and it's just this long rise you know heading up to the up up into the um up into the right and so um yeah for us it's about it's about trying to say well we, we're looking for these companies now that, that can hold on to those and australia doesn't tend to have a lot of those companies so we do have a a, a chunk so so we've got a bottle we've got a lot of oligopolies and and um and monopolies and things like that that will we think will do a, a reasonable job at holding on to their their price rises but you know the, the biggest sectors in australia the banks and resources tend to be more value stocks than than than, than quality stocks and they're the mm. ones so so it's a broad sense um you know if, if australia is sort of 50 60 percent Banks and resources. Well, well, that's fifty or sixty percent more value stocks in Australia than what you're going to see um, elsewhere, where banks are, are typically more like ten percent, and, and resources are typically more like one or two percent of the overall stock market. So, yeah. So the idea that um, now is a time to be really searching out quality stocks and, and and having those within your portfolio. That's sort of one more one more reason for um, for going off <coughs> overseas. Um, and I'll just, I'll just add to that I, the economy that we're forecasting here. I mean, obviously, miners are in trouble, big trouble in terms of the big miners are in big trouble in terms of uh, the wind down of Chinese growth and, and big falls to coming bulk commodities. But but the, the economy that that delivers that is so deflationary and gives you immense rate cuts is a real bank killer as well. Like, I, I don't mean it's going to kill the banks, but margins, like if, if interest rates are going to fall much further, here than elsewhere, then bank margins are going to fall much further as well. Yeah. So it challenges profit profit growth at the banks quite yeah. a lot. Yeah, and, and and I think you know we've we've sort of come reluctantly to the conclusion over time that um, uh, that banks are now largely um, uh, sort of government supported or, or certainly regulator supported around a lot of the world. Um, and, and the Aussie banks are, are earning great margins. They've done a much better job at being close to the regulators and, and, and getting higher returns. Um, and so there is, yeah, it's sort of two-sided to that. We, you know, as a fundamental, we, we've got problems and it could be much more devastating if Australia actually regulated the banks a fair bit more. But I think, um, you know, we no, that, this... won't, that certainly won't happen. No, that's right. We had a major bloody uh, Royal Commission into it. <laughs> but and, you've got... uh, you yeah. just got the, the hard the hard constraint of net interest margins is all yeah that, that's right is the problem for the banks so yeah. i mean i i am not i'm not, not necessarily talking about falling profits but they're going to be they're going to find it hard to, to lift them mm. yeah absolutely we'll go, go to a uh, a quick message uh, and then we'll jump back with some of these uh, the sectors to avoid we'll be back again shortly if you like what you're hearing but want a low-cost passive option, Nucleus Wealth is the first to offer passive direct indexing in Australia. The first generation of passive investing was index funds. The next gen was ETFs. 
Now, direct indexing is here with significantly more customization and control. The benefit of direct indexing is you can add or subtract investment themes, and we have almost 100 different options to choose from. For example, you could buy an international share direct index portfolio that excludes fossil fuels and arms manufacturers and has a tilt towards cybersecurity and cloud computing. Alternatively, you could buy a portfolio with no screens and an extra exposure to nuclear power and defense contractors. You can find out more at nucleuswealth.com. Now back to the show. Her doctor is... Sorry. Okay. Um, Dave's just giving away his, uh, his secrets in the, in the background. Yes. Yeah. yes. Um, there's... Uh, okay, so, so yes, now I wanted to jump to some of the themes to avoid. Actually, before I do that, though, I just want to highlight as well, we do have this um, uh, conference coming up next week um, in both Melbourne and Sydney for direct indexing. So uh, anyone who's interested in that, you can jump on the Nucleus site or the, or the MB site and macro business site and, and, and register for that. So, um, you know, as part of the Nucleus as a sponsor, you can get some, some free uh, tickets to that. Um, which we think is really the next next generation of investing for Australia. So certainly anyone, particularly anyone involved in any way in sort of an intermediary markets, you know, accountants and, and financial planners, you know, this is, I think, very important to um, to get on top of that 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 theme. Um, anyway, so so themes to avoid. Um, the big ones, I'll just run through these quickly and then we'll jump onto the, the overall investment views and some of the questions we've had. Um, China in terminal decline is, is, is our number one theme. So really, as we've alluded to it a few times, and we've spoken about it a lot on, on prior podcasts, but this idea that China is very much headed to be um, Japan 2.0, um, potentially just faster and with the worst demographics, um, uh, is, is alive and well. And, um, you know, avoiding stocks that are, um, yeah, avoiding stocks that are, that are involved in there. Uh, driverless cars, electric vehicles, uh, it's so we're certainly interested in in both these as as large as overall thematics and we're interested in the whole um uh what it's going to do for society uh we're just not convinced of the investment merits of of those at the moment um either that you know the technologically you're not quite sure who's going to su succeed and when but also the electric vehicles um you know it is very much about getting that cost down significantly so there's still costs are still too high to to really compete properly with um, uh, combustion engines. And so while we think they will keep selling and keep being subsidized and, and all that, the, the investment prospects aren't as good. And there's, and there's a price war going on in China. China's picked this as a, as one of the sectors, it's going to spend a lot of money subsidizing, trying to get as many electric vehicles out to the rest of the world as they can. They've done, they've been very successful, uh, in terms of selling the cars, but their profitability, um, and the profitability for the rest of the world is, is not boding well. Um, Stocks that have to give back those margin gains, so the sort of more of the value stocks, um, stocks that are going to continue suffer from the continued bust we're seeing in the office market, and uh, stocks on the other side of that obesity trade. They're they're all ones we're we're busy um, trying to avoid. Uh, Dave, um, any other thoughts on those? And then I've got a couple of questions from from readers to to, to fire off at you. No, swing to the readers. Yep. So the main one uh, from Jude. So question of uh, I think we've had this. A, a, a vague theme of this on in time, but it's probably in, increased in, in current things. So he, he's asking, uh, we really don't want to have to sell our nucleus investments to buy a million dollar mortgage in Sydney. Do we just leave Australia for a more complex economy that doesn't run crazy migration? Uh. <laughs> and, and let's just uh, highlight it. It ain't New Zealand. New Zealand's <laughs> the same, uh, got the, running the same, the same well, boy. <laughs> well... <laughs> I mean, I obviously can't really answer that with any authority, given I don't know you or any of your circumstances. I mean, what I would say, I suppose, is uh, I, I think the Aussie dollars are going a lot lower. So um, earning earning US dollars or or, or similar, euro even, uh, would be great yeah. for, well, for, for the coming decade. And, and, and playing right into the theme of this whole thing is if your money is in international investments or a large part of your money is in international investments, then you might have the option to move countries. <laughs> Whereas but, if you've bundled all your money into Aussie assets, then maybe you won't have the option to move countries because yeah, the Aussie dollar yeah. falls 30% and all of a sudden you can't, you know, yes, you can't afford yes. what you wanted to buy. Yeah. Quite right. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, that's about all I can offer on that. Not yeah, much. no worries. Um, uh, yeah, so is any any other investment thoughts, Dave, before we finish up? Uh, didn't you, you have another question? No, no I think, actually, I think we've, I've sorry, I've, I've already answered okay. those ones. Yeah. 
No, no. I mean, uh, if I, to the extent that I would be keeping money here, I would have it in bonds and, you know, the externally exposed non-mining stocks and that, that'd be about it. Excellent. Well, thanks everyone for listening in. Um, I would just like to uh, note that you can grab all our podcasts um, across most major and minor podcast platforms, uh, Google, Apple, Spotify, and a whole bunch of the minor ones are all there as well. If you want to connect with us, um, either jump on the website at uh, nucleuswealth.com slash contact. Um, if you've got any thoughts, uh, leave some comments. We'd love you know comments and likes. And uh, we're on a whole bunch of different social media as well if you want to follow us on those. Uh, thanks everyone for listening in and we'll see you again next week, 12.30 on Thursday.